Hi everyone, welcome back to the Science of Cricket series and to Anticipation and Perceptual Motor Skill. Uh, my name is Dr Oliver Runswick, or Ollie, uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about how anticipation and perceptual motor skill works in cricket, particularly in cricket batting, but mainly just because that's where all the literature and all the research has been done. Um, so I'm a lecturer in performance psychology at King's College London, and I'm also uh, what we would call a skill acquisition consultant at runswickperformance.com, uh, where I work with uh, the England and Wales Cricket Board um, to support uh, coaches in the women's game and also to help with measuring and understanding anticipation in the men's game um, as well. Um, and first of all, just a big thanks to Stu for inviting me along um, to be part of this uh, lecture series, and I hope you uh, enjoy what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to start off just by talking about what we mean by anticipation and perceptual motor skill. I'm going to talk about the importance of considering what information we're using when we're performing these skills. And that's really a big part of how we go about understanding training and testing um, anticipation skills by understanding what information people are using. Now I'm going to just talk you through step by step and what is actually happening when a delivery is bold from a perceptual motor perspective what information is being used, how it's being used, and how that results in us playing shots. I'll talk a little bit about the things that then affect this process, which is ultimately what the bowler is trying to do, is affect that process from the batsman. I'll talk a bit about how we test these things, and then a bit about how we can train these things. I just wanted to give a shout out at the start to a couple of papers, which are a few years old now, which I've taken some inspiration from. And a lot of the research we talk about um, in, in this video has been built on the work of, of Vishnu, Dave, uh, Sean Muller, Bruce Abernethy, uh, and a variety of people have been doing work in this area for a long time. So these are a couple of older papers if you're interested in the, in the context around where this research has been coming from. And as most of the things we cover um, as we go through will be a little bit newer. Um, a lot of the older work focused on the visual elements and we'll be talking more about the process as a whole today. So I've put all these definitions on the screen together just so um, if you're watching the YouTube video you can just easily flick back and see them all on the screen at once. Um, so anticipation, there's a lot of different definitions for anticipation. In psychology it's often referred to in terms of looking at emotions um, and for example getting an emotion based on anticipating an event happening. And why, when I say anticipating an event happening, it's kind of predicting what's going to happen in the future. So what I've put here is the ability to predict an opponent's action intentions in time to facilitate an appropriate response. This is a context specific definition that I just came up with now um, in order to put together all the different ones you might find in the dictionary and the research um, to understand that basically we're saying you need to know what an opponent's going to do in time to do something about it in response. So in cricket, that would be uh, in batting, for example knowing where the ball is going to get pitched, what it's going to do off the wicket in order to be able to actually hit it. So it's not necessarily just about predicting the future. It's more con it's more a constant process um, than just saying, I think the bowler is going to bowl a full one. We're going to be updating those predictions uh, all the time in order to facilitate the way we're actually responding to it as well. That which brings in the perceptual motor element. So perceptions about becoming aware of uh, objects or relationships or events by using information that comes in through your senses. So the information coming in, we might call that vision if it's something that we're seeing. Perception is what, what that means to us, taking some meaning from it. So seeing a particular wrist angle in a spinner, that's one thing. To a complete novice, that doesn't actually mean anything to them. But to me, it might mean this is going to be a googly. And that's that perceptual process is taking meaning from the information that is coming in. So it's also, we've got the motor element, we said anticipation and perceptual motor skill. The motor element is actually then producing the movement responses. I've put there, we don't measure this enough. In, in the From the psychological aspect, you've heard a lot from biomechanists. Um, you've heard uh, some things about injury, for example. We don't measure the movements enough from a psychological, psychological perspective. Uh, we often focus on the vision and perception a little bit too much. But I'm going to show you quite a few papers uh, today which do measure that motor element as well. And I've thrown cognition in there too. Um, some people would say perception and cognition are, are roughly um, the same thing, where perception is a type of cognition. Um, but I just wanted to throw this in there because it's got the bit about um, judging, imagining and problem solving. All those definitions there are from the American Psychological Association's dictionary about what psychological terms actually mean. But I've thrown those in there because a lot happens in cricket before the ball even gets bowled. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today um, as well. 
So just to give you a bit of an overview, um, Florian Loffing and Riven Canal Bruland uh, wrote a, a short review about where we were at in 2017, understanding anticipation in sport. And their, their highlights in this paper were anticipation, predicting an opponent's action intentions is key to successful performance in lots of sports, particularly ones where we're really uh, highly time constrained. For example, in cricket, uh, if we're facing a fast bowler, there is a lot of time constraints in what we can do. Same as catching in the field or wicket keeping as well. But also bowlers, for example, in a T20 reacting to movements of uh, batsmen around the crease and being able to anticipate when a opponent's going to ramp you in order to bowl the ball in a different location is exactly the same process. The source of information that allows such predictions include picking up on a payment's movements and on context. And I'll tell you a bit about what those two things mean in a second. And then anticipation seems to be governed by factors relating to visual as well as motor expertise. So vision ex visual expertise doesn't just mean having good eyesight, it means knowing where to look uh, and also often incorporates some of those perceptual processes, making taking meaning from information as well. But also you need to have motor expertise. You can't execute that appropriate response without, without being able to actually play the shot. Um, and also understanding, for example, as a batsman, how a bowler can bowl and having some expertise the other way around seems to have an impact too. And I'll talk a bit about that when we talk about training anticipation skills. And then the interplay between kinematic and contextual information has yet to be properly explored. And I think since 2017, it's been explored an awful lot more. And you'll hear about some of that in this talk as well. So they've outlined these two different sources of information, contextual um, and what in this slide we'll call current sensory information. Some people will just use visual, um, but actually it's not just visual information that is useful. So contextual information just across the board in, in different sports might mean things like um, the shots that someone's played before, so event sequences. It might mean understanding opponent's action tendencies and preferences. So an action tendency might be, I know this person tends to drop it short, or an action preference might be, I know this person likes to bowl out swing. So knowing about your opponents, none of that is current visual information or current things that we're finding out just from looking at them. It's because we have something that we know in advance. And that's what contextual information is normally referring to. In the dictionary, it would be something, a definition of something like information in which a certain scenario can be fully understood. So if we're just watching a bowler run in, like we often do in the nets, we're actually missing loads of really, really important information. Score related information, like the first ball of a test match, someone's probably going to try and aim around fourth stump line, for example. But then also player positioning, we see three slips and two gullies, that has a massive influence on what is likely to happen moving forward. So contextual information is stuff that is more constant, it's going on uh, often prior to the delivery in cricket, because in cricket we can't change anything, we can't be moving fielders once the bowl is running in. We have these kind of more stable sources and contextual information that are there. For every delivery, there is a score. For every delivery, there's a field setting. For every delivery, there's a sequence of deliveries that have gone before. Even for the first delivery of a match, if you know who the bowler is, there'll be information, for example, like the nature of the wicket. So there's loads of stuff going on before uh, the delivery. And, and often that is what contextual information is all about. And this is more, as you can see from the dates, more recent work. And, and I'll talk to you about some of my work in this area as well. And then we have sensory information that's also going to contribute to the process of being able to predict where the ball's going to go. So we have the relative motion of different players. That's not as relevant in cricket. But what is really relevant in cricket is advanced cues. So picking up kinematic positions from a bowler, for example, can tell you a lot of information about where the ball is likely to go. And then obviously object motion as well. So the ball flight in cricket. And actually, those early stages of ball flight are really important as well. So I've just dropped a paper down there in the corner, which we'll hear a bit more about later, which I wrote last year, which puts together a model of the different types of information that are used in striking sports in general, which is where uh, these tables are featured as well. So I just wanted to show you a bit of evidence around this idea of the fact that we're using lots of different information to anticipate. So the study you can see on the left was about how skilled cricketers and less skilled or novice players um, anticipate where a ball is going to go using what we call an occlusion paradigm, which means we see some images. In this case, it was a, a life-size uh, picture up on the wall, but not a picture, a life-size video up on the wall. So it's all to scale. You're holding a bat, the bowler runs in, um, and 
the video then stopped um, just at the, uh, the point of ball release. So we're interested in what's happening before ball flight here. Uh, it forces you to anticipate then. If you're, if you're saying, I want you now to tell me where the ball was going to go without seeing any ball flight, and then tell me a bit about what information you're using to do that, then we can start to work out what kind of things are happening before the ball's in the air. And the key thing that you'll see on this is that if you look here in the uh, graph at the bottom, we have uh, the control conditions, which basically mean there was no contextual information. We just watched the bowler run in and said, where do you think the ball's going to go? Uh, and then we have uh, a context condition where we give all the information that you would have in a cricket match. For example, previous deliveries, which is the sequence, the field setting and the situation of the game. And also the type of the game, obviously, because it being a test match, an ODI or a T20 will have a big influence on this as well. And what we found was that novices pretty much always relied on what they could see. But skilled players actually used a lot of different information sources to try and work out what was most likely to happen. So in this case, they're actually using a lot more information around the field setting and the game situation and focusing a bit less on what the bowler's doing um, when we give all of that information. And that might seem really, really simple, but the literature up until uh, quite recently had pretty much just focused on visual information. And this was a nice finding to show, well, there's obviously some other stuff going on as well. Then in a follow-up study, we had um, a similar setup, but with occlusion points uh, at different places. So we'd ask uh, for a prediction before they've even seen the bowler, middle of the run-up at pre-release, so just before the ball comes out, and then with some early ball flight. And also then again, just getting some ratings of what kind of information a skilled batsman is using in these situations. And obviously at the pre-run condition where they're not seeing any anything from the bowler, they're still using a lot of contextual information. And we found, uh, it's not shown in this figure, that the skilled performers use a lot more contextual information than people who are less skilled. And then the visual information is built into the process as the bowler runs in and it becomes more and more reliable until early ball flight comes. And that's where our most reliable visual information uh, is starting to appear. So we've got um, performers, we've got batters using um, their understanding of the game fundamentally, what is most likely to happen when this is the score, this is where the fielders are and this type of bowler is bowling, integrating that with then what they're seeing live in order to work out what's gonna happen. And that's fundamentally how anticipation is working, but then obviously we need to link that with an appropriate response and be able to hit the ball, for example, or leave the ball. Um, and there's quite a lot of work actually, if you're interested in, in that decision around it, how inhibition works in order to be able to hit or leave. And there's been some interesting writings about, for example, Steve Smith and Manus Labuschagne's more elaborate leaves being there because it's actually easier to choose a different action than it is to choose no action at all. But that's a story for a different day. So I just wanted to show you a bit more evidence here about uh, skilled and less skilled players using uh, different types of information. So this is um, some EEG, so looking at the activity going on in different areas of the brain um, in expert and novice cricketers um, watching some videos. So you have to stay really still with EEG, so this really focuses on the perceptual elements. Um, and we showed a scoreboard with a game score, type of bowler, field setting, um, and then a bowler actually running in and uh, bowling, and some so some visual cues. And the key to notice here is you don't have to understand everything that's going on in these pictures. The experts perform better across all the different conditions, so they're more accurate. And actually in, in contextual conditions, so without seeing any ball flight at all, they're getting within about 30 centimeters of where the ball would go past them. Um, but what we're seeing in the right-hand side is um, at the back of the head. So you can see the nose is at the top. That's where all the visual processing happens. Around the top in the middle is where all of our movement processing is gonna be going on. Now at the front is our kind of problem solving type stuff. So when we're showing a game situation, there's visual processing differences, there's motor differences. So we're not actually executing any movements in this study, but we're, we're seeing differences in the motor area, which suggests we're, we're relating the visual input to movements and also some differences in problem solving type areas as well. So an expert's likely to be looking at this and saying in an ODI at 100 for two off 20.2 overs with a right arm over bowler, what's likely to be happening? Same once seeing a field setting, and then once the visual cues coming in, we see a lot more uh, visual activity, but actually slightly less differences between experts and novices using the visual information. Because it actually, you need to have more experience. Um, you need to understand the game better to be able to use 
that kind of more abstract. So if a complete novice looks at a scoreboard, they have absolutely no idea what that means. But if a complete novice looks at someone's arm going in a certain direction, they will know that the ball's likely to go over there. So actually, we can see some differences in the use of information that's non-visual uh, quite strongly. So what I'm going to do now is just talk through the process of a delivery. And this starts before the game. There's actually not a lot of cricket specific literature here. And in this video, I'm pretty much just using cricket specific literature because for most of this stuff, it's out there, which is really nice. There's actually loads in baseball you can read about, tennis, two studies here in field hockey and tennis, which actually interviewed players about their processes in anticipation in returning a serve or uh, saving a penalty corner in international field hockey. And actually the coaches and players here were, were interviewed using qualitative approach. They identify that their anticipation processes, they start a long time before the game even begins. So you'll be aware of having performance analysts, for example. This is more contextual information that's going in way before you even get to the game. And actually in cricket, if you're not opening the batting, you might have been watching the bowlers from the sideline. You might be looking at the conditions of the pitch. Is it staying a bit low? Is it bouncy? Is it seeming? Is it swinging? When you're doing your laps, are you seeing how the ball's moving in the air? You're picking up loads of information. You might walk out and your partner says, oh, this guy likes to bowl a big in ducker or he's got a slower ball. All of this is playing in before you're even facing a delivery. And in, in hockey, the key themes that were, were pre-match video analysis and then that playing into the perception and action. So picking up information and responding process in a game and also that psychological factors are going to affect that, like confidence or anxiety, for example. So lots going on before the game even starts. And then we've got some pre-delivery. So you're maybe you're actually batting now. You're going to be in a certain field setting. You're going to have a certain game score. You're going to have seen previous deliveries from the same bowler. And on the left hand side there, you can see uh, an image which shows um, the big circles are cor correct outcomes of three different deliveries relative to where the stumps are. The numbers are, are centimeters, by the way. So we've got a blue one, which is kind of shortish on leg stump. We've got a red one, which is kind of top of off. We've got a green one a bit wider outside off. So the ball is coming from the other direction. This is like wicket keepers view. The small dots are a skilled batters prediction to where the ball's going to go. Uh, and the diamonds are the average prediction of the batters. So what's interesting here is these predictions were taken before anyone saw the bowler. Just being given a field setting, a game score and saying, where do you think the ball's going to go past the stumps? We can see they're not perfect, but the predictions are already moving towards the correct outcome. So most of the blue ones are closer to the blue. Most of the green are closer to the green and most of the red are around the red. And the average predictions are moving in the right direction before the bowler has even run in. It's likely that we start around the top of off stump when we're trying to work out any kind of delivery. Um, from certain theoretical approaches like a, a Bayesian active inference approach, we're probably going to be prioritizing information which has a bad outcome, which being bold is probably going to be that in cricket. So we'll be working away from the stumps, but our predictions are moving in the right direction before we've even actually seen anything happen just from understanding the game, knowing the field setting and the game score as well. So the bowl is running in. I've skipped the run up because basically nothing useful comes from the run up. There's not a lot of information until the bowler gets into the action. Um, so when I'm talking pre-release, I'm talking that bowling action just before the ball comes out up to the point that the ball leaves the fingers. And this is where a lot of the earlier work was done, understanding anticipation in cricket. And this is also when we're going to be starting to move as well. So in some of the other videos like Rob's um, and there's the um, skill acquisition video that you've got from Alex, you're going to be hearing about different theoretical approaches about connecting perception and action. And that's a kind of interesting conversation to have about some of the stuff we've talked about already, because we've got some evidence that people are using this information, but you don't actually need to move yet. How is that affecting our movements? But when we're getting to pre-release, we're probably going into a trigger movement, depending if you've got one, certainly getting a back lift up. So the movement element is coming in as well. So at pre-release, this is someone where some of the earlier work from Sean Muller, Bruce Abernathy, Damien Farrow, uh, later on Dave Mann as well was getting done and we have like a long-term evidence base across lots of different sports 
that really, really good people can pick up visual cues from opponents which have more meaning. That's why we're talking about perceptual skills, not necessarily visual skills. There's some actually some good research from Dave Mann showing that you can lose quite a lot of vision before you lose your ability to hit the ball, but they can pick up information from the bowler earlier and it has more meaning. So this study looked at world-class batters anticipating bowlers outcomes back in 2006. And actually some intermediate and low skill players could pick up certain cues from the bowler, but the highly skilled players demonstrate the additional and unique capability to pick up advanced information from specific places, such as the bowling hand or the bowling arm. So we are starting to integrate that visual information that we talked about at the beginning with those contextual factors that we had as well. So for example, picture of Mendes here, you might know a bit about Mendes, you might know what type of deliveries he's got in his locker, that's contextual factors, and then you might see the wrist in a certain position and confirm that you know that that means he's going to bowl a top spinner, for example. So learning to pick up those cues is an important part of becoming good at anticipating as well. And this is where we're probably then saying, well, that means I might be getting a cue that I want to be going forward or backwards as well. So that then gets really, really certain when we see early ball flight. So those early periods of ball flight, and I'm talking maybe 100 milliseconds of ball flight, make a big difference. So all the way up to ball bounce, and obviously with a spinner, you can move a little bit later, but that early ball flight has a lot of information in it. So some more work from Sean Muller here, across a couple different studies that actually used batters actually hitting the ball against bowlers, um, on the left-hand side against spinners, on the right-hand side against seamers, uh, wearing what we call occlusion goggles, where you can basically really accurately, to a few milliseconds, um, remove someone's vision by rapidly changing uh, these goggles uh, so you can't see anymore in a nutshell to look at where information is being picked up from. So they wear in these occlusion glasses so they either have a condition where you see no ball flight at all so just those cues we talked about in the last slide or you get the early ball flight information as well and they measured the front uh, move forward or back um, and then also the quality of bat ball contact. So did it go in the direction I'm trying to hit it or did I, did I edge it or skew it off in the, another direction? So both high and low skill players can hit the ball 20 or 30% of the time from spinners just from the pre-release cues. And actually against the seamers, some of the people were hitting up to like 70% of the time with the seamers without actually seeing the ball fly at all. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and the main difference between the high and low skilled at the pre-release cues of being able to pick short balls better if you're, if you're a more skilled player. Um, and then high skilled players were hitting 70 or 80% deliveries when it was occluded at ball bounce. So just seeing that early ball flight information from spinners and sometimes 100% of the ones from seamers. Um, this is uh, in a in a net environment, so there's probably not that much variable bounce on the pitch, for example. So once we've seen the early ball flight from a seamer, we can have a good idea about where the ball's going. From a spinner, obviously more happens at ball bounce, so that makes it a little bit more difficult. But early ball flight is, is basically getting to the point where you're gonna be able to hit the ball most of the time. And bear in mind with no occlusion at all in these studies, we're still not hitting the ball 100% of the time, obviously. So there's an effect of the length of delivery here as well, where certain types of information are more important depending on length. So we saw the high skilled batters better picking up short balls from those cues before ball flight. So the ball flight is is adding a lot depending on what type of ball you've got, what type of length delivery you're getting as well. So we've now gone through talking to your performance analyst, understanding the game situation, where they're likely to bowl with a certain field setting, that being then integrated with what the bowler is doing in their action and early ball flight. And at this point, you're making that decisive front or forward, front or backward foot movement, or hopefully you're making a decisive front or backward foot movement at this point in time, which has been informed by all of that information coming up. And as I'll talk about later, we practice loads in cricket without any of that information actually there. Um, and it's something for us to think about moving forward in training design. So now the ball's in the air, I wanted to talk about the idea of watching the ball. There's a really cool study done by Dave Mann and some colleagues that looked at uh, two of the best players in history, um, to be honest. And their idea was there's a lot of existing literature around that claims that a baseball or cricket batter can't possibly actually watch the ball because it goes too fast. You can't actually move your eyes. Our eyes actually aren't very good at smoothly moving around. They jump. 
And when we make those fast movements, we can't track stuff um, as we're making those fast movements. So the idea is that basically the ball goes too fast, so a batter can't possibly watch the ball all the way onto the bat. Uh, and Dave's story around this is he was chatting to one of the people who participated in the study who said they can tell which side of the ball hits the face of their bat, which sounds unbelievable. So they tested it. So two world-class batters, they measured um, head position, eye position. Uh, and the, the, the kind of fundamental finding was that the batters were moving their head so the ball stays in around the same point of their visual field. So they're, they're tracking the ball with their head, but they're actually making predictive eye movements in front of where the ball is. One to around where the ball's going to bounce and then another predictive movement. So they're looking at where they're going to intercept the ball. So where the ball hits the bat, they're looking at that position before the ball gets there, making what we call an anticipatory saccade. So their eye is jumping in front of the ball. So they're not tracking it all the way, but they are seeing it hit the bat by jumping in front of it. So your head's tracking the ball, but actually your eyes are in front of where it's going to go, for a skilled player at least. So it's normally relying on two predictive saccades to anticipate the location of the bounce. So seeing that bowling action, this was all done in the absence of, sort of contextual information, by the way, using a, a pro batter machine. So seeing that ball come out with the cues from the bowler, potentially seeing that early ball flight, predicting where it's going to bounce using a, a predictive saccade of your eyes, so a big jump with your eyes to the location of the pitch where it's going to bounce, seeing the ball bounce and then making a big a predictive saccade then to where you're actually going to intercept the ball and these players were seeing the ball hitting the bat uh, at a decently high speed which um, is a pretty amazing skill and something that we do not see um, from even like good professional players sometimes so it's an amazing skill to have uh, and kind of brings to question the idea that we're telling people to watch the ball when even the best players aren't watching it all the way they're watching it in certain locations so they can predict, direct their gaze towards the ball as they hit it, uh, which is uh, very difficult to do. So we've gone through the whole process now. We've had the contextual information. We've had the pre-game. We've then had integrated visual information and we've come all the way through and we've hit the ball, hopefully whilst seeing it. Now, a lot of those studies don't measure the kinematics of the batter um, whilst those processes are happening. Um, but for example, in Sean Muller's studies we were looking at, they had people actually hitting the ball and measuring that front foot movement and the quality of bat ball contact um, as well. So we're seeing that kind of evolution of information use as we're seeing then actions uh, related to that as well. So it might be that if I understand the pitch is a bit more bouncy because of those contextual factors from early on, or, a or I've got a really tall bowler, I'm probably sitting on the back foot a little bit more. But we don't have loads of uh, good biomechanical data about that interaction between that information coming in and the movement responses. Uh, some of the studies do, some of them focus more on those visual elements. So I'll talk a bit now about some factors that affect all these processes. The first one I want to talk about is what we call congruence, because I've been talking about all these different types of information. Now, a congruent information simply means it's, it's right. So this field setting looks like someone's going to bowl a bouncer they do bowl a bouncer, that means that information was congruent with the event outcome. So I might say, right, they've got three back on the leg side, I've been in for a while, looks like they're going to plan B, they've brought on their quickest bowler who's best at bowling short, likelihood is this is going to be a bouncer, maybe I sit a little bit more on the back foot or I'm at least ready to have my options of ducking, weaving, or if I'm a, personally it would be hooking every single one. Um, and it probably not ending super well for me. But all of that information is adding up to it being short. Visual information comes out. Maybe that's also showing that it's going to be short and it is short. Then my anticipation is obviously going to be excellent. All the information is leading in the right direction. But actually, maybe then they decide to double bluff me and bowl a Yorker. So they, then the field setting is not congruent with the delivery that they're bowling because I'd expect if they're going to bowl full, they're going to have people back straight, for example. And actually then how all of this information adds up to being congruent with the event outcome causes our anticipation skills to be better or worse and our timing to be better or worse. Our eye movements can change to being earlier or later. And I'll show you some data about that in a minute. The study I've got on the screen right now shows skilled and less skilled cricket batters. Really simple study I did where I showed them field settings and then a bowler running in um, and the delivery was either 
matched to the field or not matched to the field. And what we found was because skilled people are the only ones who are good at using contextual factors like the field setting and the game score, when those contextual factors were congruent with the visual information and where the ball actually went, they perform better than a less skilled group. But the less skilled group weren't really affected if the field setting didn't match the delivery because they weren't really using the field setting in the first place. But a less, but a, a more skilled player actually got a lot worse if you bowl a bad ball or you bowl a ball that doesn't match the field. So we've all got out to a fully um, before, we've all got out to a long hop before, and actually we can be in a really bad position to play them because they're not what we're anticipating to get because, for example, we've seen this bowler bowling a pretty solid bunch of deliveries. If they're really erratic, we wouldn't use that contextual information because it's not as reliable. So we focus on what information we think is reliable um, and we would maybe focus on visual information more and be less likely to get out to a bad ball from a bad bowler. But if we got a bad ball from a consistent bowler where we've been relying on their sequencing, knowing that they're probably going to put it in a certain area based on a game situation, we can get out to bad balls because the information that we've got is misleading and we're maybe in a bad position. But that doesn't happen to a less skilled person who's not using that more advanced information. And actually, full tosses from spinners in, in international cricket have an incredibly high strike rate. They also have an incredibly high average because obviously, if you are in a good position, they're easier to hit. So there is a balance to be had there. But understanding how this information links with the actual event that's happening under, makes us understand, for example, how useful it's going to be to good anticipation performance. So this model on the left is something I wrote to last year to try and put all of this information together. So on the left hand side, you'll see from preparation, there's lots of contextual information being used down to response execution with lots of sensory information. So uh, somewhere in that process, we're going to be starting to execute movements as well. But in, in cricket, often lots of the information is being used before we've even got in our stance um, because there's lots going on, which stays stable pre-delivery. And all of these arrows and boxes on the right hand side show stuff that's going to help. So information that's congruent within the event outcome, current sensory input that's congruent with what's actually about to happen, contextual information that's congruent with what's about to happen. And you'll notice I put responder influence in there. So as a batter, you're not passive. If you're playing a spinner, you might come down the track one ball and then you'll be sitting on the back for the next one waiting for them to bowl a shorter one. You've made the information be on your side from the sequencing. So on the left hand side, you men might then have deception from your opponent. So in that context, it might be you've come down the track, but the spinner then decides to still bowl your really full flow to you on the next delivery. And maybe you get a little bit deceived by it. So there's this constant interaction going on between information that you're using to work out what's going to happen and how it relates to what actually is about to happen. But you're not the only part of that process is the batter. The bowlers involved. The field setting is part of it as well. So there's a lot going on constantly updating um, the type of information you're using, whether it has a positive or negative influence on, on what you're about to work out is going to happen. And a few more other things that are obviously going to affect this process. So we've got deception from your opponent. You've, we've got the things that you're doing in T20 cricket. It might be I'm going to stand miles outside leg stump in order to get them to bowl me a wide one outside off, for example, or I'm going to ramp this one in order to get a fielder moved in order for this to happen. So you're, you have a big part to play in this process as well of how all this information interacts. Down the right hand side, I've put a few more things. The presence of information, that's important for our training. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. Anxiety pretty strongly affects the way our visual behaviours work. Our vision becomes a little bit more erratic. Uh, we get more easily distracted by certain features of the environment when we get anxious. So actually being scared of a fast bowler and it making us anxious will actually make it harder to anticipate and actually predict uh, where delivery outcomes and hit the ball as well. Um, previous deliveries will have a, a significant effect as we build up information and also the ball moving in the air, swing, seam, spin, uh, particularly we have some good data on swing uh, having an effect on these processes too. And we're not 100% just prediction machines, we will be updating things all the time, it's not like we make a decision at some point and then we just stick to it all the time, but we are narrowing probabilities down constantly. Um, and if you're interested in the theoretical angles of this, you know, you can get in touch with me and we can talk a bit more about the different ways of explaining how all of this works theoretically. I'm just really showing you the data here um, as well. And this uh, is the, the MIDAS model that I wrote last year. So that paper is freely available. Journal of Expertise is everything is free. So it's a really good resource if you're looking to read about these kind of things. 
So I just want to talk a little bit about Swing because uh, Vishnu Sarpeshkar did a couple of really good papers on this. He now works for uh, Tampa Bay in baseball, I think. Um, so these studies recorded batter kinematics in one of them, eye movements and head movements, again, different lengths and swings. So putting these two studies together is a really kind of quality investigation, which you get the visual elements and the movement elements um, all measured together to work out what's happening when batters are hitting a ball in cricket. So one of the keys was uncertainty about whether the ball is going to swing or not. So it's not that you're bowling hooping out swingers all the time, it's that you might bowl a straight one that is causing some difficulties for the players and alters the movement patterns. So it alters the way we're moving our feet and the way we're lifting the bat, for example. And then we have curvy linear ball trajectory, so the ball swinging um, reduces performance uh, and, and delays all of our movements. So the key things like getting on the front or back foot, um, the, high, the downswing, back lift, etc. The timing of these gets delayed by swinging deliveries. A ball that swings away from the batter has a more profound effect on performance or did in these studies than one swinging in. So swing delivery from your bowler is going to affect these processes. We know that it's harder to play swinging than straight deliveries, but literally all of our kinematic movements are getting delayed because we're less sure about the information coming in. And that uncertainty about whether it's going to swing or not, that's the key. So the whole time we're using information and actually just when you're walking around the, the high street or your house, you're always using information and you're always relying on what's most certain. What's the most reliable source of information here? I know this bowler is really erratic. I know this captain's rubbish and sets awful fields, so I'm not going to use the field. I'm just going to focus on what the bowler's doing. I know the bowler's really erratic, so I'm not going to not going to make any early predictions about whether I want to be sitting forward or backwards. But then if we have a lot of reliable information, we can make really, really strong judgments um, quite early on and make better movements um, as a result. But swing has a big impact on that. And so does the length of the delivery as well. So I'll talk a bit about how we actually go about measuring these things. If you want to measure how good someone is at anticipation and perceptual motor skills, it's got to be task specific. You can't be using um, cognitive testing on an app, for example, because the information that is really useful is not there, the motor skills aren't there. Uh, and often when we measure it, we do remove some of these different types of information too, and that has to be kept in mind. There's, if you watch Rob's video, I imagine, and Alex's video as well, we'll be talking a lot about perception and action. So a lot of the ways we measure this in these tasks don't have action responses, it just focuses on the visual and perceptual elements, which can be useful, but also means we don't know whether someone would have actually hit the ball really well. Um, if you're testing um, players, we'll often use what we call occlusion methods, um, which have kind of evolved over time from being basic like computer screens to being you'll see a bowler run in and you'll get occluded all these different points that we talked about earlier. Um, occlusion glasses we talked about earlier where you're actually batting, but you can remove uh, the visual information from certain points of the bowler running in. So you saw a thing about Sachin. Tendulkar training uh, and actually just closing his own eyes um, at different points of ball flight and trying to hit the ball still to make sure he was able to adapt uh, earlier and later and occasionally so he would shut his eyes when the ball is running in and open them after the ball's coming out or the other way around just to uh, you know make sure he's good at getting information from all these different places. The picture on the right is me working um, with some of the uh, England pathways testing anticipation skills using 360 video where the players would get dropped into uh, a pitch in a certain game scenario with the scoreboard and using 360 video and a VR headset. This is just an Oculus Quest 2, um, which uh, one of the most popular Christmas presents this year, and we use a GoPro 360 to make the videos. It actually means it's completely portable and you don't need a computer uh, or a high power computer and you certainly don't need a computer scientist to make these things. Um, so this was just 360 video. You put it on the keepers there behind you when the spinner's up, you can hear all the chat, you see the scoreboard, you see the field setting. Um, we get the players to talk us through their kind of options, what they're thinking. Uh, and then the video, the bowler runs in, the video includes it and they tell us where they think the ball's going to go. And that's been able to differentiate different levels of play um, across the uh, age categories uh, so far as well. Um, we can also use what is really virtual reality. 360 video isn't really virtual reality. It's just video recorded in 360. So you need a VR headset to watch it. 
a real virtual reality task would mean you're actually hitting the ball uh, in the virtual environment too. Uh, and that's that. what the beauty of that is it becomes it's very easy to manipulate when you see information. You can get really accurate measures of where the, where the bat's going and things like that. You can also just use biomechanical analysis of someone actually playing, see what point they move forward or backwards. Are they making their movements earlier or later? Are they making different uh, bat swings, for example? Performance analysis as well, who's playing well against what? And then just basic, more basic performance testing. How well are they hitting the ball against different um, options? How well are they hitting the ball potentially in combination with an occlusion glasses, for example? Um, so it's not particularly easy to force someone to anticipate because we're often seeing the full process and maybe someone's very good at compensating for not using certain information sources with their motor skills. It's hard to break all this up, which is why I've put that perception and action point in there as well. But pretty much all the study we've talked about have used some of these met methods or a combination of them, such as kinematic analysis of the batters, eye tracking as well i haven't put eye tracking on there because it doesn't actually measure anticipation skills it just measures what your eyes are doing whilst you use them um, and we've had verbal reports here as well so lots of different ways to try and measure these things but it's pretty hard to do because it's hard to force someone to have to anticipate and show where they think the ball is going to go before it actually goes there so combination of all these things can be pretty useful uh, and i'll talk about how we can train it in a minute so the final bit I want to say is, you know, we've got a decent idea of how these processes are working. How can we get better at them? And my number one answer is include all the information in practice. All these things I've been talking about that facilitate your ability to anticipate and execute good perceptual motor skills. <clears throat> most of it is missing half the time in practice. We regularly practice without any of the contextual information. We're normally practicing on, on good surfaces, which is hard to deal with practically, but it's very easy to say it's naught for naught. You've got three slips in a gully. Here's some cones to show where they are pinned in the side of a net, for example. But we often don't include those things either. Playing against real bowlers is really important as well. Hard to do again practically when we have such strong limits on bowling. But here's just a couple of images to show the importance of this. This is Ross Pinder's work on the left where he looked at information movement coupling. And we've got an image there, which on the left, which shows someone hitting a bowl against a bowling machine. And on the right, someone hitting the ball against an actual bowler. And that's just to show you are practicing a different thing if you do not include the information that you have in a game. And you're practicing different shots and different techniques. If we're using drop feeds, if we're using bowling machines, if we're even using dog throwers, we're going to be resulting in a different movement outcome because the information is different. And here's, a, here's one of my studies, which looked at anticipation and contextual factors. And on the left, we have a, play, a batsman hitting the ball. He's wearing an eye tracker as well um, when we've just given him a scenario. And on the right, um, with no scenario, both the balls pitched in the same place against a real spin bowler. Um, and basically, you're executing different shots again because you've got different types of information. So real life always rules. We want to be hitting balls against real bowlers with all the information that we can include or at least exposing people in our pathways to doing that as much as possible. And that's hard in cricket when we can't play matches during the summer, um, but that's the fundamental crux of it is people are gonna learn how to use the information if it's there, they're not gonna learn how to use it if it's not. Um, and some of these are really key predictors of future performance, some of these kind of anticipation skills. We actually had a, there was a lunchtime chat with the England performance analyst uh, not so long ago talking about the fact that a good schoolboy can hit a bowling machine at 85 miles an hour, but they can't hit a bowler. And that's for this kind of reason. So there's a little paper here from the Journal of Expertise again that Sean Muller and some colleagues have written about embedding what they call psycho-perceptual motor skills uh, into training. Um, so understanding these skills and getting them into the training environment. So you can have a look at that and also check out the Constraints and Skill Act video. So I'm not going to talk to you all about theories of training because you've already had two videos about that. But number one fundamental is keep it task specific. Think about the, the bowlers too. I've talked a lot about batting, um, but this is an interaction between batter and bowler that's going on all the time. And also the field setting too. Uh, and that's the fundamental of what cricket is, an interaction between those two people and, and the field setting, trying to get a one up on each other. And there's always going to be an exchange of different types of information between them. Just wanted to make a note of a couple of recent papers from John Brenton and um, where he's looked at uh, motor expertise and the fact that basically perceptual expertise might be linked to motor expertise. And there's a variety of theoretical perspectives like common coding, we might call it, that um, suggests that if you can do the skill, you're better at predicting it as well. 
Um, and they've done some training interventions where they've had, for example, people learning to bowl in swingers and out swingers and getting better at predicting in swingers and out swingers as batters uh, as a result. So there is an element of being a good all round player as well. The queuing for information sources, so that might be like saying, right, well, can we put a fluorescent wristband on a leg spin bowler to make sure people are actually attention is going towards their wrist? It could be more explicit than that. It could be making sure you're discussing the game scenarios when you're practicing your batting, all this different kind of things, just making sure people are using the information that is there. But like I said, go watch your, your skill act videos that have already gone on in this series. There's some debate about using inclusion methods for training. There are methods out there. There is companies that provide these for baseball, uh, not at the moment for cricket. Um, but the idea of saying, well, all this testing we've done where we're cutting it off and you're predicting where the ball's going, that's forcing you to try and use the information that's there. Maybe that's useful. And there's a few studies out there which show it can be useful, but the information is not super strong on using those methods for training yet, but they might yet get better, especially if we can integrate virtual reality where we have movement responses as well. The beauty of VR would be we can be showing you specific deliveries that learn, land in specific places much more accurately than a, than a real life bowler could do. Um, so as VR continues to develop, I do think that will probably become a primary use for this kind of thing, especially for people who can't be playing because they're injured or because we've run out of overs from our bowlers. Or because that's one of our key issues, obviously, is that we can't be facing real bowlers all the time. But fundamentally, real life rules expose people to the information they're going to get in a game. We work loads on technique in isolation, expecting that to make us better players. We very rarely work on the other end in isolation by discussing things like contextual factors. An NFL quarterback spends a lot, a lot of their time ju doing just that, but we don't really do it in cricket that much, understanding what's like to happen in certain situations. So that might be something that we can maybe pick up in cricket and develop a little bit more. I hope that was useful. If you're interested in how some of this stuff works more theoretically, then do feel free to get in touch and have a chat about it. You can find out more about the variety of other work I do uh, on runswithperformance.com or you can follow me on Twitter, drop me an email, get in touch wherever you'd like. Uh, but thanks again for Stu to inviting me along uh, and I hope you enjoyed listening.